Coming up on this week's show, some classic GTA games are back. For Nintendo 64 that can play Switch games. And we talk to Core Design's legend, Gary Ancliffe. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our amazing mates at Bitmap Books. Now, you need to check out Sega Master System, a visual compendium dedicated to celebrating Sega's 8-bit wonder and covering classic games like Alex Kidd, Fantasy Zone, Shinobi, lots more as well, over a massive 424 pages featuring legendary interviews and artwork. So you can check that out and lots more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 289, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show, the show that just before the weekend, every single Friday, brings you interviews with industry legends, superstars, people who were behind our favourite games growing up. And of course, we bring you up to speed on everything that's been happening in the world of retro gaming and technology over the last seven days with our dedicated den of D-pad destroyers, the Retro <laughs> Hour crew. Do, do you, you're becoming do you more, a... <laughs> more like Dominic Diamond every day. <laughs> do, you, do you have like a list of these ready, like to go? <laughs> I'm not even. It took me about 20 minutes to come up with that earlier on. That's the last week I'm doing this. It's too hard now. I, I, no, I like it. Keep coming up with them. If anyone's got any suggestions, Deep get in touch on Twitter. That would be appreciated. I might, I might put that on my CV. <laughs> now, of course, we have got some big news stories to get through this week. I know. Um, again, you know, as soon as we recorded last week's show, big announcement came. Something that we've been talking about for a while that we kind of predicted was going to happen: that Grand Theft Auto, a few of the classics, the trilogy was going to get remastered, and uh, I'm quite pleased to see that they're coming back. Um, we'll get more into that in just a moment. I must admit, I've not been retro gaming all that much this week, um, because I did finally get my hands on a PlayStation 5. I feel like you probably downloaded like Pac-Man on it straight away. <laughs> <laughs> I did, actually. I've got quite a few retro games on there. I was going to say, I feel like you probably set it all up, and then was just like, right, I'm going to sit back and uh, play some retro games on well, it All now. that power. Yeah. <laughs> Use it for Pac-Man. Yeah. I've got it there. 4K, HDR, hooked up to my 65-inch TV, playing Pong. Pong, yeah, um, absolutely, <laughs> it's got to be done. <laughs> but I mean, there are retro games coming out for modern systems all the time, and that is quite a big part of what we cover on this show. And also, we talk to um, people who made the games that we played as kids. Now, I know Ravi in particular, you and I, and um, Joe, not so much an adventure game fan, although I know obviously we've covered it quite heavily on the show before. I loved point and click adventure games growing up. Oh yeah, I, I really love them, and you know. Of, of course, we're Amiga fans, and Amiga was a great platform for that. But also, Core Designs were an absolutely amazing group. And, you know, Nottingham and Derby have a bit of rivalry. We always have a bit of rivalry between the two cities. But um, I love Core, and we, we love the folks from Core as well. We've gone over and seen them and talked to them about developments. And, of course, that was a fantastic studio that birthed Lara Croft as well. Yeah, it's interesting because um, this week we're going to be joined by Gary Ancliffe, who um, he worked for a lot of um, companies that focused on 8-bit systems, particularly around the Sheffield area. Um, he worked with their pal developments, a company called Alligator, um, High Tech. He was with them as well for a while. And then Core Design, but he was at Core at quite an interesting time, kind of just before they kind of made it big with the Lara Croft. I mean, before that, they were doing stuff like, um, I remember Jaguar, XJ220 on the Amiga. Great racing game the core design put out. And then, do you remember Bubba and Sticks as well? I think we've yeah, done episodes and, uh, about that Rick, game Rick before. Dangerous as well was another yeah. one, yeah. And, um, but also, they, they did have a hit with a point-and-click adventure game um, called Curse of Enchantia. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard of that. I've, I've never played it, but, you know, we do get some details on that. And also, Universe, which was a, a really beautiful-looking game as well. I, I love the kind of... It was like a purpley kind of uh, cyberpunky game. Really, really interesting. I, I know you had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, well, I remember getting that game. Um, I think Amiga Format gave away a cover disc with quite a long playable demo on there. Um, I've got a feeling it was Christmas 94. And I remember that Christmas. Um, I think it snowed. You know, I'm painting a good picture here, aren't we? You know, being in my room, you know, the, the glow of my CRT monitor late at night sitting there on my, my PJs, playing Universe with my Christmas tree behind me. And I've got really vivid memories of that game. 
But like you said, I mean, it was um, a really atmospheric adventure and very technically impressive as well. I mean, this was a game that ran in 256 colours on a basic Amiga 500. And bearing in mind, most games back then were like, what, 16 or 32 colours at most on on a stock yeah, Amiga? Yeah, it was using half bright mode, wasn't it? So it's yeah. like a, a kind of graphical trick. But also talking about these companies like Alligator and High Tech, you know, we've we've not really covered these companies no. before. And uh, Power Developments as well. Also the uh, the Scooby Doo license. Am I going to do it? My uh, Scooby Doo Shaggy. There you go. <laughs> That's my impression. Ravi's been, Ravi's been desperate to do that Scooby Doo impression. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm it was like, I'm going to do it. Am I going to do it? I'm going to do it. <laughs> that was so worth a wait, Ravi. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously working on. Yeah, he did have Scooby Doo and Scrappy Doo, and that was a licensed game from Hanna Barbera. And I always find it interesting, particularly because that game came out, I think, around 1989. Kind of at that stage when, you know, we've talked to a lot of um, people that work for companies back then who licensed, like, you know, cartoons or toy licenses from big companies who didn't really get video games all that much. And it was kind of an interesting time when, you know, kind of finding out how involved they were and how kind of valuable they viewed the video game yeah, side yeah, of what stuff, their requirements so. were around the brand as well, because Scooby-Doo was huge, you know, yeah, uh, r- really big brand. I'm not going to do any more. <laughs> <laughs> we can breathe easy. <laughs> <laughs> so Gary Ancliffe is going to be our special guest. He'll be coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. You know, I always get comments every week. You always say 20 minutes and it's about 40 minutes. He'll be on soon. Don't worry, Gary's coming <laughs> Sometime out. Sometime soon. Now, before we get into the news stories this week, let's give a big mention to one of our wonderful supporters. This is our friends at Michelle Thomas. Now, you know, we recently did a survey on our website that closed over the weekend. I've got to say, you know, we, we are going to be picking a winner of that £100 prize very soon, and we hugely appreciate um, all of your input there. What is quite interesting is that we do have so many listeners all around the world. So, you know, wouldn't it be nice one day to do, I don't know, an episode of the Retro Hour in, um, you know, French or German or something? I mean, I, I studied German, you know, for like five years at school, and I could barely string a mm. sentence together. So that's a big task. However... With this, I, I don't know. I think I think it could be done a lot quicker than five years. And you know, I go to a lot of these retro shows and like we've yep. been to Amiga Germany and we've, we've really been around the world and it would be awesome just to kind of even learn on the fly uh, the language and then kind of at least have a few phrases to say or, or understand what other people are talking about. And you know, that is one thing I think particularly us Brits... We're quite lazy at learning other languages. I mean, we, we all kind of do it at school, but the way they teach it here is not very good at schools, which is why something like this is really valuable. Now, Michelle Thomas, it's, it's, you know, it's a very, very long-standing proven method. And this is an audio-only language learning method that actually works with how your brain naturally learns, retains, and retrieves information. You've been trying this for a couple of months now, Ravi, and you said you know, you've had better results with this than anything you tried before. Yeah, so it really does feel differently structured from like the kind of school atmosphere that you have, but it's still got that kind of classroom-like uh, structure. So, you know, you, you're in a student session and uh, and Michelle Thomas is your actual course teacher and then you're sitting there and there's two other students as well. So when you learn the language, you're not going to make mistakes. Now, you just sit there and you kind of repeat it and, and and the mistakes are made for you by the other people so you don't know, kind of feel embarrassed but it's it's a fantastic method it's it's been around for years actually my mum used to do it on um audio cassette tapes mm. uh, back in the days and it really really impressive method of kind of staying motivated and being able to construct sentences straight away which uh, really helps with the progress actually and it, it kind of just makes you feel satisfied when, you, when you've actually done it. And I think because it's audio only as well, obviously that means you can listen, you know, in the car, if you're, you know, driving back to the office these days, or if you're on a flight even, you know, maybe you've got a holiday coming up, curled up on the couch. So you can learn a new language stress-free as well, working with how your brain naturally learns. And there are so many languages, um, 17 different languages that you can start with as well, including Egyptian, Arabic, um, you've got Italian in there as well. You've got French, German, Greek, Korean, the loads of the Norwegian you can learn too. So you can stay motivated as you start to speak and form your own sentences straight away. And you'll be really impressed at how quickly you progress and eager to continue with it as well. So if you want to get involved in this, we'd love you to try the Michelle Thomas method. Learn a language for good and start your language journey right now with 25% off. So of course, we get you these incredible offers 
please take advantage of them and support our show. All you need to do is head to this website, michellethomas.com. That is M-I-C-H-E-L. T-H-O-M-A-S dot com. Just use the discount code RETRO at checkout and you can claim 25% off any Michelle Thomas course. And a big thank you to Michelle Thomas for their support of the Retro Hour podcast. Now, of course, we all love GTA. I think that is, you know, one series of games that I think, you know, we kind of all cross over there. We're all big fans, particularly those classic games. I think, you know, I've got to say Vice City is my favourite in the series. I think that's one of nearly full stop one of my favorite games i like, i'd at least say it's in the top five like five mm. city is absolutely amazing i can still remember the map and every single kind of alleyway and all the clubs and all the jumps oh, I, I did a stream of vice city and i just got straight back into it when i was playing straight away i feel like i've memorized most of san andreas Vice City. That's that's I, bigger I, as well, isn't it? That is bigger. <laughs> I, and don't get me wrong, I play GTA 3 Vice City a lot, but San Andreas was like, I was like 14, 15 when it came out, and that was like every night, you know, after school, you know, at friends' houses, just just blasting it. You know, the amount of stuff you could do in that game for a PS2 game. Don't get me wrong, GTA 3 and Vice City were like groundbreaking, but for me, San Andreas was just like mind-blowing but I can yeah imagine uh joe with his backwards cap in grove street <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> you're not far <laughs> off um i feel like i'm sure we covered the rumors for this about 100 maybe 200 episodes ago <laughs> well we talked about we talked about um the remake which was a fan kind of um that uh, wasn't too long ago was it no we talked about the reverse engineering that yeah. happened uh which was called re gta and that was a kind of reverse engineering of gta 3 yeah and that was a fan project and that ended up getting taken down and we were like why has this project been and taken that, down that, that was only a couple of months ago wasn't it but i remember yeah, us yeah. talking about the rumors of it being remade i, I swear well I'm, i mean to be fair ago. this kind of feels like it's been you know the the most obvious thing to yeah. happen because of how you know obviously gta 5 the biggest selling entertainment title in history. The fact that, you know, there are these older titles that everyone loves as well, GTA 3, Vice City, San Andreas, and it made sense that they're going to bring these three games back, remaster them, this trilogy for modern gen systems. So that is what's going to be happening. Those three games are getting remastered and apparently going to be out by the autumn this year for various platforms. Yeah, so it's a leak, isn't it, at the moment? It's not been announced, Mm. but it's a leak from Kotaku saying... That it's, you know, essentially Rockstar, uh, is it Rockstar Dundee in Scotland are working on them? And yeah, like you say, it's meant to be coming out end of October, start of November. So it's interesting because I'm, these free games, you could actually get them on like Xbox 360 and Xbox One, but they weren't remastered or anything like that. They were just ported over like straight ports, weren't they? This is going to be a, mm. a proper, proper remaster. And apparently one of the people who has leaked it has actually had, you know, seen the footage and had a hands on with it and... It looks like they're running in the Unreal engines, like they look amazing, apparently. You know, they look as good as a lot of these fan mods people have been putting out over the years and stuff. Do you you remember when they used to release them at separate stages? So they would have a delayed release on a certain system and you'd have a GTA exclusive first on it was always system. playstation wasn't yeah, it generally was say, PlayStation it was but then first, the xbox yeah. version i remember the vice city was a lot better like they had uh reflections on the windows and stuff and they'd they kind of cleaned it up a little bit to kind of you know uh add a bit of glam to that release so um it's it's great to kind of see it it's a bit like in the gta legacy having these uh all released on a console as well and uh, uh kind of all cleaned up and looking nice I would love to get a proper physical copy, but apparently the rumour is going to be digital only. But I would mm. love a nice physical copy with like all three games in it. And the maps as well. And the maps with get, like yeah. three separate discs and, you know, a nice big poster of one of the women or something that you used to get as well <laughs> on the back of the map. That would be pretty cool. Joe's suddenly 15 again. I am. <laughs> Grove Street. He's dressing up. Um, have you seen this recent trend of um, GTA multiplayer? So uh, 5M is the client that you actually use, and there's a lot of role-play servers on there, and uh, people are playing GTA uh, kind of role-play. So you're going around a city, people play the role as police officers, as cops. Well, I remember doing that originally on Vice City on like Mm. a 56K modem, and we used to connect (laughs) to servers, and you'd type like 
I am walking and picking up a gun. Because <laughs> you, you didn't even have the animations to do that. And you'd have like bank robbery scripts and stuff. But that seems to be a new aspect that's uh, got really big. So maybe one day on the Switch, we might see a, a, a role play thing. That's that's my dream <laughs> to kind of see a role play mod that everybody's using. You know what, though? With, with that game, I mean, I know on the PC that was modded. So much, wasn't it? That's probably one of the most modded games ever. Yeah, it's and, turned into a whole new game with this roleplay thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, and and that's the thing. I've only ever really played it on consoles, so I haven't really got any experience of that. But I would love to check it out. But I think you're right there. It would be cool if maybe they got some of the best kind of PC mods of that era and kind of bake them into this. That would be incredible. It's becoming it? think, like its yeah. own kind of engine where stuff's getting created in GTA Five and becoming games of its own, like like in Half Life or. or, or people used to mod stuff like where Team Fortress came from and stuff like that, and they create their own titles. And, it, and it's kind of like that. It's happening using the GTA engine, and uh, it's pretty impressive. I've even seen a Red Dead Redemption multiplayer um, role-play mod as well, which is pretty mad to see that on the PC. I think they definitely get a lot of kind of fan kudos if they did kind of put some of those kind of mods or hacks in there as well, you know, as optional extras maybe. But yeah, amazing to see those uh, three classic GTA games apparently coming back to the uh, the PlayStation 5, um, new Xbox Series X and the S, and in the Switch as well, which is quite interesting. I do love the fact that Nintendo seemed to be a lot more relaxed about stuff like this. I mean, could you imagine Vice City coming out on like the GameCube or something back in the it day. Just, you just didn't see it. But then they'd put Resident yeah. Evil 4 out, which is, yeah, like, in many ways, a lot more violent. So it's just strange. I'm, so, I'm hoping they don't take the swearing out or something and, like, <laughs> censor yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do a lot more. I guess there's a lot more mature content in Vice City. But, yeah, it is good of Nintendo to, well, I say good of Nintendo. It's cool that they're doing that now. Yeah, and finally something to play on my PS5. Hopefully I'll uh, yeah. get a few um, <laughs> Some PSN more retro games. In my... <laughs> Talking, yeah, exactly, yeah. Now, what about this? An N64 that can play Nintendo Switch games. This kind of blew my mind because, like, Ravi was trying to explain this to me earlier on. And <laughs> it was... I, I, I couldn't figure out if it was 3D printed, if it was, you know... Um, you know, actual using a real N64 with the guts of a Switch in it and stuff like that. And he was trying to explain to me that this is the N64, you can actually dock the Switch into it. And I I was so confused. So I had to look on the picture. So, you know, and it's a, it, we're a podcast, so sometimes it's hard to, you know, describe something. But honestly, click on the links. This looks awesome, doesn't it, Ravi? Yeah, it's by a guy called a Quinadian Bacon. And yeah. um, he's actually... Cut, got got the shell, got to the N64, and yeah. then what he's actually created is the dock inside. Um, yeah, but the dock it, it contains a lot of lot of things that they don't usually have. So it's got a USB C power supply in there. Mm. It's got um, a USB two ports as well at the front, but also yeah. he's managed to put them inside the N64 ports as well. Yeah, so, so. It, it looks really slick, like. It doesn't look like, you know, somebody's just sawed it out. Do you know what I mean? Or just <laughs> drilled out the uh, controller ports. Like, he, he's he's done a really, really, really tight, nice job of this, hasn't he? And then... He, if you saw this on the table, you, you wouldn't... You would never know. Yeah. You wouldn't yeah, look twice at it. It's like, oh, somebody's got an N64 on the side. But what I think's really cool is he's made a custom, like, Switch... Um, is it not the Nintendo Switch? Like, custom Switch, like... Uh, a l- little latch mechanism. Yeah, like a latch yeah. mechanism to actually make the Nintendo 64 open up. The only way I can describe it, you know, like a like a clamshell, like a PS1 would, and it opens up on hinges, and then that's how you dock the Switch in and then close it, don't you? Yeah, um, it's kind of a bit like loading in a VHS cassette. Yeah, um, yeah, that's when a really good When you put it in, you it. open up the N64 case on a, like, hinge and then slide it in and then close it and it and the, and the dock works but amazingly he's added fans in there he's got yep. um, led status and this is all controlled by an arduino nano as well so that's actually controlling all the power and yeah. um, he's even managed to customize and uh, add in a little card reader at the side uh, for the actual switch games yeah so you so don't you- actually have to put the the game in the nintendo switch to then put in the n64 you can actually put it in the side of the N64 yeah, which, which is amazing. So you don't have to awesome. open it all up. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Again, we talk about so many of these kind of fan mods, but this is one of the most impressive I've seen so far. The sheer amount of effort that's gone into making this. I just think how amazing that would be if <laughs> like you get a friend comes over 
and you got your N64 there, you're playing like, you know, Zelda Breath of the Wild or something, you're like, uh, I don't remember the graphics looking that good on the N64. <laughs> well, I reckon he could sell this as a kit, you know, if, if he got all the components and uh, I, I definitely want one. And yeah, uh, yeah, I guess yeah. it would mean gutting a an original N64 though, uh, wouldn't it? But maybe uh, a broken one. Yeah, well, I mean, justified. that's what he did. He bought a broken one for spare parts and then got the idea. But it'd be nice even if he just did a, a YouTube video, like a how-to, you know, Mm. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool to see. There's a lot of soldering required. <laughs> I was going to say, it looks quite an advanced project. Definitely way beyond any of my electronic skills. I mean, I'm looking here, there's about 35 images. You know, the step-by-step is put on Imgur that you can check out. I mean, again, it's not something that um, someone who's never picked up a soldering line before is going to be able to do in the, on a Saturday afternoon, is it? It's quite involved. Yeah, it's pretty involved. I can't, I can't see myself, you know, I've, I've used a soldering iron like twice in my life, so... It's not something I'm ready to do, but I think it's something Ravi could probably do, I feel I like. I could give it a go, but I'm yeah. just thinking, like, I'd love to put it in something else, like, you know, a Switch and a Virtual Boy. That would that would be too expensive, <laughs> be, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be pretty cool. You, you, you slide want... it in where the uh, eye bits <laughs> Ravi's are. finally bought a Vectrex. He's put a Switch in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ripped, it apart, ripped it apart on day one. Yeah, <laughs> so, can you imagine? Yeah, very, very cool. So you want to check out that full series of images, I'll put those in our show notes, along with all our other stories at theretrohour.com. Now, I can already hear Joe getting excited over this next story. It's a <laughs> Castlevania one, Joe. I know how much you love Castlevania. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Castlevania. This is this is one of my stories that I've put into the news this week. No. Um, yeah, no. Oh, <laughs> a Castlevania story must be a Joe one. Um, yeah, so a Castlevania beta has just been shared online. So did you say beta or beta? Beta, sorry. A Castlevania That's what beta. British be- if I say beta on my YouTube channel, people are like, it's not beta, it's beta. You know, it's kind of coming together now. Isn't it? Oh, oh, tomato, beta, tomato. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Beta, beta. Um, for Castlevania New Generation, for us people in the power region, or Castlevania Bloodlines for everybody over in America. Um, so this is beta 0.5, which has been dumped online this week by essentially... So what the beta 0.5 is kind of like a a legendary beta for this. It's a Mega Drive game, Castlevania New Generations. And essentially what this beta is, is it's missing a lot of levels which were never in the final product, which was seen in a lot of magazines back in the day, you know, when the game was getting reviewed and stuff like that. And, you know, we were seeing... I was going to say trailers for it. Obviously, you didn't really get trailers for games back then. But, you know... Magazine but, articles. Ma- magazine articles about the game and stuff. There was, you know, there's a famous level on it you know, the players playing on a Zeppelin, uh, which was never in the final game. And essentially what's happened is in 2014, somebody, a Castlevania Dungeon Forums, um, which is a famous Castlevania forum, somebody posted that they had a ROM cartridge, not a ROM cartridge, sorry, the beta cartridge from one of the magazine reviewers. And that person has now sold it on eBay. And obviously the person who's bought it has dumped it online straight away. Um, and it's available Good. for people to play, um, which we'll put in the show link in the show notes as well. Um, and it's got all the missing content from the final game. No explanation to why this content didn't actually kind of make it way make its way into the final game, and maybe hardware limitations and stuff like that. But apparently, it works fine on an emulator, um, or what you know, or works fine on a. Um, on an EverDrive, which I think is really cool. And it's got the missing level. Um, and then it's also got a few extra parts to some of the stages. Like there's a, I forget, I think it's the fourth level, which is set in like an industrial, Victorian industrial area. And there's like a steel mill, which was never in the final game, which is in this version as well. So always on the lookout for these cool hidden, you know, not hidden, but cool levels that never made it to the final product, which, you know, kind of go down in history as like, you know, it's like the, uh, is it the hidden palace zone with Sonic? Mm. You know, it's always cool when these things come out. But yeah, you're fully playable. It apparently is a little bit temperamental and a little bit glitchy because obviously it is, it's the 0.5 version of the game. Uh, so it's not the finished version of the game. But I, I like the stories behind them. You know, how they, they always turn up on eBay, don't they? And I, I want to know how much it was sold for, how much the, uh, the listing was. But I've yet to find it, unfortunately. And it's not in the article. It would make your eyes water, I'm sure, Joe. Yeah, more than likely. <laughs> it's definitely with everything what's been happening at the moment. You know what, though, as well, because I think, you know, with games like this, particularly that era, I mean, you know, how big were Mega Drive carts who were like... 
four I think megabytes, up to about eight megs. Eight megabytes, yeah. Four yeah. To, yeah, some of the later ones are right. But, you know, you've got to think then, if they're trying to put all this content into a game, yeah. there had to be stuff they couldn't fit in there that mm-hmm. got deleted, I guess. That's probably why it never made it in the first place. Yeah, and I imagine, you know, the steel mill level looks like it's got a lot of, you know, classic parallax scrolling and stuff like that in it, which I know, obviously, the Mega Drive did well. Um mm. But I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm no technical nerd, but if there was a lot of it, maybe it took up more space. I don't know. But yeah, it's st- still interesting. And anything Castlevania, just because we never get any new Castlevania games anymore. I always lo- I always love to talk about it. Any excuse. So if you do want to give that a try um, on your EverDrive or your Mega Drive emulator, we'll uh, link that up in the show notes as well. Now, before we get into our chat with Gary Ancliffe, talking about games like Universe, Scooby and Scrappy-Doo, um, loads of these amazing companies in the UK that focus on 8-bit machines, core designs as well. Some should talk about with Gary in just a moment. Before we do, it's nearly the weekend, of course. Time to put your feet up and maybe crack open a delicious cold beer. Now, of course, this is our great friends at Beer52, who've been massive supporters of the Retro Hour podcast. And, you know, whenever us guys get together, which I know we're planning on doing again very soon, there's always a case of Beer52 nearby. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's always one in Ravi's fridge for us to nick and... You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's always a snack in there for me to Nick as well. Usually Nick from Ravi's dad, actually, because I know your, your dad's a big Beer 52 fan, isn't he? Oh, yeah, he, he absolutely loves them. And uh, yeah, I've been redoing my living room. So you guys need to come round and we'll get some Beer 52 and have some gaming and uh, actually try some new ones as well, because it's a really good service for finding new beers and, and new drinks. Well, I've actually got one of their um, latest cases of Beer 52 here, and this is celebrating the Windy City of Chicago. So this is our friends at Beer 52, the world's most popular craft beer discovery club. And what about this? We want to give you some free beer. Aren't they just magical words? Absolutely magical. Nothing better than free beer. Are there two better words in the English language than free beer? (laughs) Well, listen, we want to get this. Delivered to your door, eight delicious craft beers all you have to do is cover the five pound 95 postage so if you're based in the uk head onto this website right now beer52.com slash retro that's our exclusive code you'll be helping out the podcast by doing it beer52.com slash retro and at the moment you can sample the finest craft beer from the coolest chicago breweries from bridgeport to beverly all for the price of postage and beer 52 they do this every month they're on a mission to find the best beer anywhere in the planet and they visit a different place each month and they seek out the best small batch breweries and that is one thing we love about them that they the focus on the little guy so you can sample their finest craft beer and they will carefully put together a case that they send out to their lucky members each month so if you want to get involved in this i mean obviously it depends on what kind of beer you're into as well you can customize your case if you don't like dark beer choose a light option they also include an award-winning beer magazine called ferment and you don't realize how interesting beer is until you look through ferment. And they include two tasty snacks to wash down the beer. So there's no minimum commitment. If you want, you can take the free case, try it out, see what you think. If it's not for you, pause or cancel at any time. But if you want to claim this free case of beer right now, head to beer52.com slash retro. And a big thank you to Beer52 for their support of the Retro Hour podcast. Now, of course, it is one of our favourite weekends of the month coming up. It's going to be our patrons hangout on Sunday where our lovely patrons come on. We have a little hangout on a Sunday night. We all have a bit of a chat. We normally do a bit of a retro kind of show and tell, you know, show off our pickups and that kind of thing. Any things you guys are going to be showing off this month? Yeah, well, I've, uh, you know, I do DJing with my Amigas. Uh, I, I had Amiga 1200s before and now I've got my uh, 600s. So I miniaturized the whole DJ setup and I've got some cool little gadgets and stuff that I'm going to show off. And it's it's good to be back on the decks again. And, you know, I can't wait for the patron chat. It's really nice to catch up with everybody and also kind of drool over all the stuff that they've got. I wonder if Ravi's going to swap his um, Amiga 600 setup for the Amiga Minis when they come out, oh, DJ no, with them. No, no. <laughs> Original hardware for me on that. I, uh, I was thinking that I might drag my PlayStation 5 in, but um, it's like nearly as tall as me. I was going to say, you're just like holding it on your lap. Like, you will be dragging it. <laughs> it reminds me of like um, Little Britain, where he used to hand like the pencil to the guy and then the pencil would be giant yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this Sunday coming up, 8pm UK time, all patrons are welcome. This is where for a couple of hours on a Sunday night, we just geek out about 
everything to do with retro, you know. It's kind of geek culture, really, isn't it? We talk about movies, magazines, uh, phones, MP3 players, video games, of course. And also, you can get a bit of help. I mean, you know, maybe you're working on a project at the moment. There are really knowledgeable bunch of guys, and it's always so much fun. So if you'd like to hang, hang out with us this weekend, we're doing it on Sunday evening, and you'll find the link on our Patreon. And also, you get some other perks as well. You get the usual show ad-free. You get it early. And before we do the patrons hang out, we're going to be recording the next episode of our patrons exclusive podcast, The Retro Hour After Hours, which I think is probably the more nostalgic of the two podcasts that we do. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, we've just done our survey and, and, you know, it actually finished today. So a few people have said on it, they want to hear more of our opinions and kind of like our childhoods and stuff like that and what we think of particular consoles. But that is literally what the after hours is because this podcast yeah. was never meant to be about that but a lot of people ask for that so that's kind of what the after hours has become um so we kind of talk about you know we've we've done a lot of episodes about like the mega drive and the snares we're thinking of doing the ps1 next um but we've also been doing the retro years haven't we kind of thing so we've been talking through lots of big years in retro gaming you know we've done 99 2000 2001 we're going to be doing 2002 next and you know we don't just talk about the games that came out and the films and stuff that and technology that came out that year but we talk about like where we were in life as well so you know if people want to hear that um you know which a few people have been asking for the after hours is the place to be for it and uh 2002 is a pretty cool year i do remember some good stuff coming out uh one i'm going to talk about is medieval total war Oh yeah, great! But also a BMX XXX, which was that really <laughs> bad version of a Dave Mirrors <laughs> BMX game. Didn't know you were a fan, Ravi. So yeah, Ravi's going to be um, loading his mini displayer up with NSYNC and Holly Valance songs to get him ready oh, for uh, going back to 2002. Um, if you want to check out the Retro Hour After Hours podcast, that was a Patreons exclusive. You get a load of other perks as well. So if you want to join us on there, the reason you're doing it really though, is to support this podcast and make sure that we can keep bringing it out every single Friday for you and uh, keep bringing these guests to you as well. And of course, you will get a mention for supporting the show in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And a big thank you this week to Martin Meldrum, David Heaney Writer, Alistair Brush, Whatnot, and Mark Hillary, who all made donations into our Patreon. We hugely appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join them, head to our website at theretrohour.com. All the details there. And hopefully we'll see you for the patrons hangout on Sunday night. Right then, next, some incredible stories about companies like High Tech, Power Development, Alligator, and of course, Core Design as well. With our guest, Gary Ancliffe, is next on the Retro Owl podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for the main event and the bit of the show that we look forward to every week when we welcome on our very special guest, someone who is a veteran in the industry, who's worked on incredible games that we've loved over the years. And uh, this week we're joined by someone who um, has worked for many companies, including, of course, the infamous Core Design. Let's welcome on our guest this week, Gary Ancliffe. Hello, Gary. Hi, how are you doing? Very good. Thank you. Really appreciate you joining us. Now, um, before we get into the stories of, you know, these amazing games that you've worked on over your career, I mean, we always like to kind of go back to day one and find out a bit about your geek credentials. <laughs> um, I mean, do you remember what was your first ever computer or video games experience then? Where did your journey first begin? Yeah, so, I mean, I vaguely remember it. <laughs> it would have been when we went on holiday uh, when I was a child. I mean, I remember... Or doing Skagness in a caravan, that sort of thing, or going to mm. Butlins a little bit later on. And I think around that time was when arcades were just starting out. In fact, not even a full arcade, I think. I think you'd occasionally, so maybe if we went to Butlins or something, they'll have like a, um, a cabaret night, that sort of thing. And you might find an arcade machine stuffed in the back where the bar was or something like that. Yeah, Space Invaders was definitely the first uh, arcade game that I ever saw and played, I think. You know, my dad put in, I don't know, 10 pence in or something like that. Me not knowing what to do, dying quite quickly. But that pull, I think, of the, especially the audio with um, Space Invaders, Yeah, that, you know, it's driving... Well, I guess adrenaline goes as you get further and further into the game, isn't it? And like a heartbeat, isn't it, going faster? Yeah, and faster. yeah. So I think that was probably my first experience, and then 
uh, you know, early games like that. I remember playing Scramble uh, early on, and then there's things like Galaxians maybe a bit later when I got a bit older. Computers were slightly different. I think we went down to Comet. We were on our BMXs as, as kids, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, something like that. They had a display of a Commodore 64 uh, in there, and they had Suicide Express running on it. And that, I think, was my first ever computer game that I played. And at that point, it was like, I want one of these. <laughs> you know. Well, what was the first kind of system you got at home, and how did you uh, persuade your parents to buy it? Yeah, so we had those little arcade machines you know the ones with just like the little lights where they just light up and you move left like like the tiny ones yeah yeah Yeah, so we had those beforehand but i think it was this around this time when i'd seen the c64 i think so i remember as a kid looking through like the argos catalog and i remember seeing uh spectrum 48ks advertised in there and you got this full page spread with it with um all these different components added to it. You know, you got your tape player, you got your micro drive there, that little specky printer thing that was there, Kempston joystick uh, adapter and joysticks, and then a little portable TV. And I think up to that point, that had been what I sort of wanted uh, as a computer. You know, you, you look at these things in these magazines, these shiny, shiny things to tempt you. And it was like, yeah, yeah, I want, want, want a computer, want to get a Spectrum. And then when I saw this Commodore 64 and Tony Crowder's game, it was like, ah, complete 180. Now I've seen this and heard it and played it and everything. It was, yeah, must, must have one of these instead. The next question is actually getting hold of one. Doesn't matter how much you badger your parents, if uh, they can't afford it or whatever, <laughs> you're not going to get one. And they weren't cheap back in this day and age. I think the spec was about 130 quid and the C64 was about 240 at that point. Mm. You know, I'm from a working class background. My dad worked in a steel mill. He was up at 4.30 in the morning working in this massively hot environment all day long. And my mum was doing two jobs. She worked in the kitchens at the college and a cleaner as well. So it was quite a stretch for, you know, how can I have a C64 as a Christmas present? But what my mum did was, and my kids will take the mick about this, because I've told them this story probably more than once, so now they take the mick. But she she made me this deal where she said, if you can put half the money towards this, then we'll get you this for Christmas. Uh, Mm. And the bit my kids take the piss out of is me having two paper rounds, telling them that I had to do this for like a year to scrape together the money. You know, I was that I I heard a load of... A load of people kind of did that, you know. They yeah. were like mowing lawns on double yeah. shifts and like, yeah. you know, w- working hard for that kind of early machine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and it was hard work. I mean, uh, so it was a straight after school paper round, and then there was the Sunday morning one with those hideous, massive Sunday papers. <laughs> like a skinny 12-year-old lad on a BMX, you know, being pulled off <laughs> left, right and centre <laughs> by this huge weight trying to, you know, bike around the top of Stannington in Sheffield. And, St- you know, Sheffield's not flat, <laughs> so it's quite hard work. Oh, but um, you worked up a sweat doing that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, you know, that and money from birthdays or that sort of thing – got that together and yeah my, my dream came true um that was the best christmas ever for me i think up to that point i know a lot of kids you know would buy a computer just to play the games on what made you want to learn to program it then when did that kind of come in yeah i mean obviously i played tons of games initially i think there's a couple of bits to it. i've thought about this before um and i think there's there's the inquisitiveness i always wanted to know how things worked so I was the sort of kid that would take the calculator to bits or the watch to bits and, you know, most of it would go back together and it sort of worked, but not always. <laughs> and it was the same with bikes, taking those to bits and putting new parts on whatever. And I remember I used to play with um, Meccano and Lego before I got the computer. So I had the creative side. I like building things. I liked understanding how things worked. And I think just as I got more and more into playing games, 
it was that same sort of mentality. Right, I want to take this game to bits. How do I understand how it works? How do I get into the nitty gritty of it? What do I need to do to to make my own games? You could type in listings from magazines and that sort of stuff. You know, you had the basic listings for games that were yeah. five, six pages long. And you spent God knows how long typing them in. And there was always mistakes and they hardly ever worked or whatever. And you could learn a little bit from that. You know, if it was in basic, then you could try changing a few bits here and there. And that gave you a little bit of an end to mm, how does it work? But I think, to be honest, a lot of the games and magazines, they, they moved to just data statements. So it typed it in basic, but it was just a whole bunch of numbers. And that didn't really mean anything. So yeah, I did that for quite some time. And then I came across, there was a basic program to be an assembler. And the way it worked is you typed the basic program in, and then you ran it. And then you typed in lines in the basic interpreter again. And then you could assemble that code uh, into machine code and run it. So that that gave me my first in to going a bit further than just, just what basic was. Well, which magazines were you reading and what were your kind of essential pieces of literature? Yeah, the essential piece was Zap64, really. I would periodically buy other things, other magazines, and I think you used to sift through those at the news agents and look through um, to see if they had any listings in that might be uh, quite useful or, you know, would ignite that creative spark. That was some of it, yeah. Yeah, I do remember spending like entire Saturdays, you know, typing in those listings and then checking them over and they're not working. And then you get next month's issue and it'll be like, oh, here's the errata. We got this wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. seeing those regularly. <laughs> there was some of the later ones used to do checksums, especially when they were uh, the ones that were just the data statements. Mm. Um, so that was helpful. So you get a checksum and it'd say in line 150, you've made a mistake. So a checksum each line or something like that. So that was quite useful. But it, it does teach you the principles as well, definitely, because you can kind of, after doing a lot of those listings, you can work out what's going on and like wh- which bits have actually messed up and maybe yeah. like just de- debug it yourself on the fly. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I moved on from that. So when when I had this um, assembler written in BASIC, that piqued the interest to, to go a bit further, um, to look at assembler and start looking at you know, what What could I do at a lower level? But it, it was very, very limited. I can't remember how many lines of code you could type, type in, but it, it ran out of memory really, really quickly. And I think this is because it had the assembler already in the memory, and then it had sort of maybe resized the area for BASIC, and that's where you were, you were working off this limited set. So I'd seen a few bits here and there of assembly, I remember Zap64 did something from maybe Gary Penn or maybe the other Gary. Um, but it was so so simplistic. I think it was literally just adding a few numbers together. Mm. And as a kid, it's like, what use is that for a game? <laughs> How do I make a game out of adding some numbers together? <laughs> um, but I wanted, I wanted to experiment more. I think what I did was I there was obviously adverts in the back of magazines and there was the action replay cartridge. I think it was the yeah, first was. one that I got. So again, more paper rounds, more saving money up. I think it was like 40 or 50 quid or something like that. So they weren't cheap. And uh, Commodore 64 reference manual as well. And once I bought the action replay, what that allowed me to do was I couldn't assemble anything. It didn't have a, an assembler in there, but I could type in um, hex data statements and disassemble it. So you got the Commodore 64 reference manual that tells you what the instructions are for the computer. So the assembly language mnemonics. So you got things like LDA, which is load the accumulator and accumulate as a register. It's the only one on the 64 where you can actually add or subtract numbers from it. And you got two other registers, X and Y. And you had these um, mnemonics and you had the hex um, code next to it. So what I would do is type in the hex numbers to write a program to 
you know, load some numbers in, add numbers together, whatever, stick them in the um, sprite position um, hardware registers uh, to try and get things moving around on screen, that sort of thing. And then the Action Replay had a disassembler. So you'd type the hex in, then you press D and look at it, figure out where you type the incorrect number in, go back to the specific memory address where that number needed to be updated, update that, go back to disassemble, uh, see if that worked, yep. Save it off on tape. Make sure you save it off on tape before you crash the machine. <laughs> you got a yeah. lot of typing to <laughs> which, do Which again. happened a lot, I imagine. <laughs> yep, it did happen a hell of a lot. Um, <laughs> And then you off, off you go, and we're having the C64 reference manual. I mean, there's a it's not a massive book, but there's a there's a reasonable amount in there. But I think the first I don't know half to two thirds maybe are all about basic and how to program in basic and all that sort of stuff. And I just skipped over that. <laughs> I wasn't interested in basic at this point. I tried it out. It was really slow. I couldn't do the things I wanted to. Uh, it just wasn't worth me looking at at that point. Uh, that's how I felt. And then you had the um, instructions for the 6510, which is a 6502 derivative um, CPU in the 64, and the hardware registers. And the hardware registers did things like set the screen address, move the scroll register in the screen, move the, set the sprites uh, positions and the um, addresses for where the sprites pick the data up, set the colors, that sort of stuff. And yeah, you would just experiment. You would write to these hardware registers and see what they did. Well, it sounds like, you know, you're obviously really learning how the hardware works um, by doing all this. I mean, do you remember the first game that you, you made at home and got running? I remember trying to make loads of games at home and never finishing any of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what would happen is I'd, I'd have ideas and I'd get part way through and then I'd start playing another game and I'd see something else. And, you know, it's like a kid in a sweet shop. It's like, ooh, now I want that shiny thing. Ooh, I want that shiny thing over there instead. So, yeah, I, I, I tried all sorts but I don't remember ever completing a game at home. Not fully fully fleshed out. I would probably get basics of a level up and running. You know, you're talking like side-scrolling side shooters, um, but probably not a lot in it other than um, a scroller, a sprite on screen, and maybe some bullets, and probably not even some enemies at this point. You know, it's it very, very early days for me. And then I also used to write um, my own little demos for myself. Again, this is just banging on the hardware, really. Um, mm. What's the phrase from Yak? Oh, oh, dancing on the copper. That's the one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you were, this was a thing. You were just banging on the hardware going, what can I make it do? And I think I'd... I remember at school, occasionally we swapped tapes and someone gave me a tape with um, a demo on rather than a game one day. And I'd never seen a demo before in my life. And then that was it. It was like, oh, what can I do? So then it's like, you know, you're writing raster bar demos and you're opening the borders and you're trying to write sprite multiplexers and all this sort of stuff. And again, you're honing your skills by seeing how far you can push things. I mean, this is a well, one megahertz processor, which doesn't do a lot in one mega. You know, one megahertz in a fiftieth of a frame is is not a lot. So, it's all about counting instruction cycles and seeing how far you can push things. Go on, Ravi. Well, well, you mentioned uh, Yak there, Jeff Minter. Were there yeah. any kind of programmers that inspired you, or any any games that you were trying to clone yeah, or create? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. The wonderful thing back then was you'd have these um, young adults, really, in the magazines, especially something like Zap. And they're sort of like pop stars, really. And it was great to be able to see, you know, put a face to, to these games and, and find out a bit about what they were doing. So Tony Crowther was prolific at this time because um, I'd seen Suicide Express and his name on the game and then played other games of his later, absolutely. Andy Braybrook was absolutely amazing. Euridium was just, yeah, just blew everyone away when that came out. Oh, yeah. And he did the uh, the diaries in Zap 64. And that's what I used to love, the reading the diaries about, oh, how how do these guys actually go about making a game? What's, you know, what's it like on a day-to-day -day basis? 
And there's people like Chris Butler, who he was pushing things really hard. I mean, Commando and Ghosts and Goblins for the time were absolutely amazing. And then he did Space Harrier. And it's like, how on earth did you do something like that on a character based <laughs> one <Yeah>. megahertz machine? <laughs> And yeah, there's 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 a few others. I mean, Archie McLean uh, played Drop Zone and IK Plus. Loved those games. When we were chatting before, uh, Dan, you're asking about whether I, I went to the Computer History Museum, and I said, yeah, yeah. go there often with my kids. Well, I was playing Drop Zone in Computer History Museum in Cambridge uh, one day, and a guy walks up behind me, and I was playing it. I just had a quick glance as someone walked behind, and then I just stopped and I turned around and I went. Are you Archie McLean? I said, oh wow! He said, "Yeah, how did you know that?" I said, "I just recognise you," and it was brilliant. <laughs> you know, I, I got to you know we had a long chat. Uh, I got to introduce my son to him, and I got to tell him basically, you know, as a, as a child growing up, you were one of my heroes. You know, you inspired me to be better and to make games and try and do the sort of stuff that you did. So that was brilliant. I thought, I, yeah, it was really lovely to speak to him. Uh, so he's a lovely guy as well, isn't he? Yeah. Well, how did you enter the industry professionally then? Yeah, so this is back in the late 80s. There's a lot of unemployment at that time. Actually, so I started at Alligator, and I think actually when I was at school, I had a friend whose uncle either worked at Alligator or it might have been one of Mahoney's who actually ran it. And I remember giving him a, um, a loading screen that I'd made. Just, just I think I copied a T-shirt or something like that I had and said, oh, you know, if Alligator ever wants someone to, you know, draw loading screens, you know, I'll do it for them sort of thing. <laughs> Being incredibly naive as I was at that time. Uh, and I got a message back from them saying, oh, it's great that you've sent this along, you know, um, keep up the good work. It's, it's really good to hear from you, but we, we don't really want, need anyone at this time. And I just wasn't good enough is the, is the honest answer. But, you know, you saw their games, um, you were interested in what they were doing. You know, I wanted to make games as, you know, as a job. Um, my mom wanted me to just get any job because there was so much unemployment. You know, she was, you know, trying to get me to go and apply to the post office or, you know, just get some proper job type thing. <laughs> but I just didn't want that. I wanted to try and pursue this. So, yeah, I went to college on the youth training scheme. <laughs> um, I was supposed to go on a computer course and they had so few people that applied that they cancelled it before I even started. And without me even knowing, they'd moved me onto a business studies course, which was the dullest thing on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were Alligator like? to work for and uh, we haven't heard much about that company could you tell us some stuff yeah so it was late in the day for me so what happened with the youth training scheme is they put me on this business course it was really boring I did a work placement at um, a company selling steel in Sheffield well, Sheffield's you know known for its steel but it wasn't what I wanted to do and the careers officer at the college she was brilliant she worked really hard to try and find something that interested me and I got a placement at Alligator coding on the C64 and after two weeks they just offered me the job um, so that was fantastic and I think I was on something like £10 a month more than I would have been if I was on the youth training scheme, which was even less money than being on the dole. <laughs> so you can imagine, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, where, where I started. But that was my dream. I wanted to make games. I, I'd have gone in there for nothing and made games. But it was at the end of Alligator's lifetime. So there was only about maybe eight people there, I think, when I started. It was in a single room. I mean, I was, what, 17 years old. I didn't know a lot. Uh, I was still learning to program, if I'm honest. But they were really, really helpful. I, um, there was a guy there, Ian. I can't remember his surname. He was probably the one of the older programmers. And by old, I mean, like, mid-20s. Um, and he sort of took me under his wing a little bit. Uh, and he was really helpful in any questions I had. He'd, he had all the time in the world. Uh, which was really good. It was a little bit different. So there was Tim Mahoney, who was there, who was the guy that ran it. 
and his brother Mike, I think. Uh, and yeah, it was a little bit different. Um, the, the environment, so I had a, a disk drive for the C64, which I'd never used before. Um, I wasn't writing an assembler anymore. We actually had a compiler, or an, well, an assembler. Um, you would have two Commodore 64s um, next to each other. Well, Mick Lister did, who was writing the main game. And there was a parallel cable between the two. And you would assemble it on one machine and download it over the parallel cable to the other machine. So when it crashed, you didn't lose any, everything. But it would take 20 minutes to assemble off disk, um, whereas I was used to just typing in hex and disassembling it, and you knew there and then whether it worked or not. Well, whether there was an error or not in what you'd inputted. Whereas now, if you made a typo, well, you could get to 19 and a half minutes into your compilation, and then it failed, and that was quite painful. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a great place to start, a great place to work. It just didn't last uh, that long. Was your first project there Battle Stations then? Was, what do you remember about that? So I think that's the first one I worked on. So that, from memory, that's the one that Mick Lister was working on already, and I came in to help out, basically. You know, they took me on because they saw that I could sort of program a little bit. And I guess they hoped that I would improve, uh, which I did. <laughs> so I got to just do, I guess, odd jobs, really. First thing I think Tim asked me to do was uh, sound effects and music driver. <laughs> and it's like, okay, never done anything with a SID chip before. Um, I'm not musical. <laughs> I don't have any training in this. And it was just, again, experimentation. I played around with the SID chip. I wrote a little editor um, where you could just modify the uh, hardware uh, registers, and then you could save them off and just started playing around with it and making sound effects uh, for battle stations. And that wasn't too bad. That was reasonably successful. I stumbled across some of the Paradroid um, yeah, Paradroid sound effects by accident, uh, and then heard them, I guess, years later. Uh, so that was interesting. That that was just random chance. But the music driver, God, that was a nightmare. <laughs> I remember disassembling Rob Hubbard's music driver on the C64 and trying to understand some comprehension behind that. And I got, uh, I, I made a bit of progress, but I didn't fully understand it. And Tim was writing the music in Aegis Sonics on the Amiga, and then I had to type in the notes uh, onto the C64 and try and replay those. We got some music out of it. It's not 100% in tune in places. <laughs> I did the best I could, <laughs> but it wasn't great, to be honest. And then other various bits and bobs, like the title screen, high score screen, uh, they asked me to do some graphics, uh, the clouds in the backgrounds and stuff I drew. But yeah, that was all, it was all really good fun. It was a great learning experience. But yeah, I was, I was there probably nine months would be my guess. And then one day we walked into the office and all the machines were gone. And then we were told, mm, sorry, lads, uh, I know we haven't paid you for a while, but actually we're going into liquidation, which is a real shame, to be honest, but... You know, back then, Sheffield was quite a, an active place for game development. I mean, you moved to um, another Sheffield-based company, PAL Developments, which actually seemed like quite a small company at the time. Um, how did that move kind of happen, and how did you get in there, and what, what was that company like to work for initially? Yeah, so I have absolutely no idea how I transitioned from that one company <laughs> to another. Um, I don't even remember having an interview that I think... So there's a guy there called Richard Stevenson who did Spectrum stuff. And I think Mick Lister knew him. And I think we both went along at some point to see if there was any work. And I think I was just taken on there and then. I can't remember if Mick joined us for a bit and then went on and moved and did something else himself. But yeah, so I, I worked with Richard Stevenson there for a good many years. And yeah, PAL Developments, PAL stands for Palmer Acoustics Limited. Um, so that was a company he already had set up in the 70s, and he just reused the name 
So Richard Stevenson, I think at the time, was the only programmer working there. And I think David Palmer had been at Alternative Software in Pontefract. And he'd come out and started his own thing up instead. And he was building the business up as sort of a competitor in the budget space. Uh, so I had Richard there. He was um, working on Spectrum stuff. And I thought, I think he bought in the odd game here and there and gradually building up the company uh, and eventually setting up high tech software as the publishing side. So yeah, I worked with Richard. I can't remember how long. It was the two of us in a back room, a uh, tiny, tiny office, like, you know, like one of these little single bedrooms that you'd have in a house. It was mm. that size. And off the annex of that was a photography studio. Uh, so we were just, yeah, shoved out in the back there and worked there with him, mainly converting what he did to the C64. No, to the Amiga at that time, I think. The thing I remember was that Rich was a a really, really nice guy and he was massively into his music. But the problem was I had to listen to the Smiths on repeat for about a year. (laughs) It drove me mental. (laughs) It was like being being in prison. (laughs) (laughs) As I say, he was a great guy. But, oh, God, yeah, that's the memory. But you can't listen to the Smiths anymore now, I guess. Absolutely not. (laughs) And you Uh, expanded onto the 16-bit platforms as well. How did you find that kind of moving from 8-bit to the Amiga and the ST? Yeah, so I was brilliant, actually. As much as I love the Commodore 64 and its simplicity is a real asset to it, it's a real asset for learning something, the simplicity of, of that machine. Uh, but it is slow, and it's only got three registers in the CPU, and only one of them can add numbers together. Uh, so it's quite limiting. And then you go to the Amiga and the ST with a 68K, and you've got all these registers, you've got all these different instructions. It could do so much more. Uh, and it's, yeah, you know, uh, nearly eight times faster uh, from a megahertz point of view. Um, more colors. The audio, well, I mean, the C64 audio, it's it's got that feel, hasn't it? It's, it's, it's a synth. And even though you could do sample stuff on the Amiga, there's something about the C64 SID chip that people just fall in love with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really love working on the Amiga. Uh, I liked, I enjoyed working on the ST, but it was a bit challenging for, well, anything with sideways scrolling. And it was the same as learning the 64. You know, this time I had a 68K manual and the Amiga hardware reference manual. And then I can't remember what the ST book was, but it was a single book for um, the ST hardware, which was a lot more limited. And you just playing around with things again. Um, The copper on the Amiga was wonderful. Um, You could do so much with that. It made, you know, you you changed like um, the background colors as the um, raster line, raster scans coming down the screen. So you could have all these sort of like sky um, blends of color changes and things like that. Uh, The scrolling and stuff on there was great. There wasn't much in the way of hardware sprites, but you had a blitter. Uh, There's all sorts of stuff you could do. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I absolutely loved working on those machines. And even the ST, the ST was um, challenging, but also fun. It was it was simpler in a way, so that made things a bit easier. I mean, you know, worked on some um, big licenses as well. I mean, one game that you did was um, Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, that obviously, you know, one of the most famous cartoons ever. What was working on that license like? And did um, Hanna-Barbera have like much involvement and say in it? Yeah, so Scooby and Scrappy was much, much later in the um, lifetime of um, high-tech power development. I've done a lot of stuff before that, yeah. And Hanna-Barbera, they used to send a guy over who would look at uh, the sprites that we were doing. It was the same guy each time. Uh, I remember him coming over and looking at something on the C64 
and he used to call the pixels Lego bricks because <laughs> they were fat pixels. They're really <laughs> wide. <laughs> and he was great because he, and, you know, we explained to him what the hardware restrictions were and he was happy enough to accept that. So, yeah, that worked out really well. And it was the same on the Amiga. You You wouldn't have the same... So on the C64, your hardware restrictions for the sprites are 12 fat pixels wide by 21 pixels high, and you've got eight sprites that you can get on the screen, unless you write a sprite multiplexer, and then you, you can get more on, but you're limited to eight on a line. With the Amiga and ST, because of the way you moved memory around, and it was a, essentially a 16-bit machine from a, the, the bus um, level, you would have, you'd make your sprites uh, divisible by 16 in the width. So you would try to engineer things so that they, when you animated them, they didn't go beyond whatever multiple of 16 that you'd chosen for your, your sprite width. Vertically, it wasn't such a problem. You, you could make them change a little bit. And he'd come in and he was great. He would work with us on that. Um, he'd help the artists um, maybe reshaping things a little bit here and there where it's saying, oh, the character should be a little bit more like this. There's times he'd come in and say, mm, this is not quite the right colour. And then we'd explain that, say, the C64 has only got 16 colours and there is no other option. He'd, yeah, he'd yeah. accept that. You know, and go, okay, well, that's the best we can do. Fair enough. So that was that was good. I don't think they really had too much involvement in the game design at all. We play through through a few levels and you know, they were platformers and that sort of stuff, so there wasn't anything particularly bad in those. So it's fine with that. We did do some work with um, Warner Brothers, I think, at some point as well. But that was different because we had to send everything off to America. Um, I can't remember what we were doing there. Daffy Duck or something like that. We, I know we had the license for a whole bunch of Warner Brother characters and Richard had drawn up a whole bunch of sprites and we'd sent them off to America and they sent back a completely redrawn um, sprite set. Everything had changed. All the dimensions of everything had changed. <laughs> the, the, you know, adhering to this 16-pixel boundary had all gone out of the window uh, they'd made loads of suggestions and stuff, and it was like, we just can't do this. This is this is not how computers work. With games, if you know, you've got a limited amount of memory, so yeah, that was that was a lot more awkward actually. They just didn't get it at all then, though. No, not really. They weren't doing games at that time. They were just doing cartoons mm. and stuff. Um, obviously, very different these days. Oh, um, how did you end up moving to Core in 1994? Did you have to kind of go to Derby and? Uh change location and stuff yeah late in the day with high tech um we had another company where we didn't get paid for months and eventually it went into liquidation i think it phoenix back up afterwards for a bit and then disappeared completely um but yeah i'd we yeah had to move on because there wasn't employed anymore wasn't getting paid i'd always um I had a real fond affection for, you know, Gremlin games and core games. Certain games really stood out. You know, they were pushing the boundaries. They, you, you saw these in magazines or you played them or whatever, and you, yeah, it's like, I wish I was that good sort of thing. I think with core, I think I just pulled the address out of my magazine. I wrote them a letter. I sent them my... Um, some of my games, and they wrote back <laughs> and said, do you want to come for an interview? And it's like, yeah, brilliant. Jeez. <laughs> and like I said, I, th I think when I went to high tech, I, I didn't actually have an interview there. I think that was word of mouth. So this was my first ever interview. And it was like, you know, core was just so up there in my aspirations. It's such a huge thing to me. So I went out and bought a suit and I went down in a suit, had an interview with Jazz. And one of the first things he said to me was, are you sure you're a programmer? Because <laughs> I've never seen a programmer in a suit before. <laughs> Not a common sight. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, the interview was just a chat with him, really. Um, I mean, he'd seen my games, we had a chat. He seemed interested. He showed me around the studio. He introduced me to a few people. And yeah, that was it. It was it was a done deal. He said, yeah, come and work for us. Um, 
And I can't remember if Richard Morton came down at the same time or if he had an interview slightly later, but we, we basically started at the same time. I was still living in Sheffield, uh, so I was commuting to Derby every day. Uh, I was picking Richard up from Rotherham on the way there, so I was leaving at 7.30 in the morning, trying to get there for it was probably 9.30 by the time I actually got there. And the M1 decided they were going to do road works for about a year and a half, <laughs> which no, is an nightmare. absolute nightmare. <laughs> so there were some days I'd, I'd set off at 7.30 and I wouldn't get in the office until 11 o'clock. It's just an absolute nightmare because you're just stuck, stuck in road works for like two hours. So that, that wasn't a great part of it, but, you know, being there, getting there was great. And I don't think Jess had... I don't think he knew what to do with us initially. Um, so he, he just said, oh, I think I might be able to get the choplifter um, license. Why don't you guys write choplifter on the Amiga? So, yeah, we started on that, got a level together, just the basics of a level, Put in, started experimenting with a few ideas. We had a nighttime mode with like a um, flashlight on the front of the chopper. So it lit up the little guys running around as you, you flew by and stuff. And then... Just turned around at some point later and went, oh, sorry, guys, I, I didn't manage to get the, the license. We'll have to do something else. <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Core had some incredible games up till that point. I know one um, game that I love that they did was um, Curse of Enchantia, which mm. is obviously a, a point-and-click adventure game. And uh, you actually made an incredible point-and-click game when you were at Core um, called Universe. So where did the idea for that game come from then how did development on that start then? well thanks thanks for that that's that's really much appreciated um i remember when i was at core after we'd done universe i got my first ever piece of fan mail from a 12 year old boy who'd been playing universe absolutely loved it so that was brilliant um oh. so when we started i think curse was just wrapping up but it was in a different room i think when we first started at core we were in the original building a much smaller building in on ashbourne road which was sort of like a big house with lots of little rooms different teams in different places and the tiniest car park in the world yeah, it was potluck whether you actually got in the car park and then you had to park down the actual driveway of it. And then when you wanted to leave at night, you had to reverse into the main road of the A52, I think it was, <laughs> Ashbourne Road, so that wasn't much fun. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so those guys were finishing Curse and I didn't really know much about that at the time. I think I played it a little bit towards the end. Maybe I did a bit of play testing, but I, I didn't know that much about it. And then, yeah, as I say, a choplifter was dropped. Uh, Jez wanted us to do something. Universe was evolving. So the, the, the ideas in the story actually came from Rolf. Um, he'd worked on Curse of Enchantia. And he already had this story. Now, I don't know whether this was supposed to be some sort of follow-up. I don't think it was. I think he just had a story. Rolf had... He's one of the most creative guys I've ever worked with. He's, he's got lots of ideas. He's got lots lots of fingers in pies, lots of different things going on uh, at different times. But he had this story that and these ideas that he wanted to make an adventure game from. And we had a few other people. We set up a small team, basically. Um, so let, let me go over the team. So there's Rolf Moore who, like I said, absolutely amazing artist. I think, actually, I didn't realise this until one day. We were one day, we sat, we were working, and there's a building site behind us where they're, they're building this um, new flats for students or whatever, and all of a sudden it just starts rattling off um, why they were building things in certain ways and what these different components were and whatever. And it's like, how do you know all this stuff? And I think he said, oh, I'm a qualified architect. It's like, what? <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> um, but he's, he's, he's the most talented artist I've ever worked with. It's just incredible. I mean, it's, if, if you go onto YouTube, not YouTube, onto uh, Google and type in Rolf Moore and Colossus, you'll come up with this um, image of this spaceship 
Uh, it's absolutely massive. Um, so I can't remember if it's a painting or airbrushed or a combination of the two. And you look at this thing and you think this is Star Wars level ability. You know, the people doing like the previous for Star Wars and stuff. And he did this before he was even in the industry. He did this either at art college or university. And I think it took him like nine months to do. And it's the most amazing piece of artwork you've ever seen. It's actually in universe. We, we scanned it in um, to universe. And he used to do all sorts of um, other covers like um, VHS video covers, uh, book covers. I think he did an Arthur C. Clarke book cover and uh, comic covers. So for Dark Horse comics he used to do. Um, so he was the guy with the ideas, the original storyline, original ideas there. And then we had Gary Bottomley Mason uh, join uh, as part of the team, who we call Jim will fix it. <laughs> Core had this unwritten rule that if you had the same name as someone else there, you had to change it. <laughs> so that that, that had... was the bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 okay, it's got nothing to do with Jim will fix it. What it was is he came in as a tools programmer, a PC tools programmer, but he hadn't done a huge amount of programming. He, he, he got the basics and stuff, but he didn't have a huge amount of experience. And I think he was, he was doing a little bit. I think they were doing a game initially. Um, and he was trying to get scrolling working on the PC. And he was having a real hard time with it. And I ended up getting it working for him, but I'd never worked on a PC before. And then he was supposed to be, I think, do some tools programming for us. And he, he basically just turned around and said, oh, this is just too awkward. It's too much of a faff. I just don't want to do it. I'm going to be an artist instead. <laughs> and he just flipped. That was it. He was like, one day he was a programmer, the next day he was an artist. Um, but he's, he's a prolific game designer. He's got such a creative streak running through him. And he's a good artist, but his it's it's how he brings everything together. It's the ideas, the um, the collaboration, the working together, and coming up with stuff that and his storytelling, which are his real strong points. Well, so for the, having him and Rolf working together was amazing. Well, the graphics were absolutely stunning as well, and like having those kind of purples in there, and and mm. and, and the blues and that kind of look. Um, how did you get the kind of Two five six color graphics to work <laughs> on the Amiga five hundred. Yeah, so Stu, who was a uh, animator, um, named this Spack Mode, <laughs> which is uh, not particularly PC. If you, uh, yeah, well, we'll not go into that. We came up with an acronym, <laughs> which we called Super Preadjusted Color. Um, so the way what what happened was Rolf had his own little room where he would airbrush the backgrounds, um, and he would then scan those in onto a PC that were two hundred and fifty six colours. And the thing about Core was everyone was pushing it. Everyone was pushing to be pushing the hardware, pushing the game design boundaries just trying to make things better. Every single game you did, they tried to make it better than what had been before. Um, and I was the same. I, I wanted to do something better than anything I'd seen before. Um, the AGA chipset wasn't out. I didn't even know anything about that um, while we were developing this. So I thought, how on earth can I do this? And what I came up with was a method to change a number of the colors every single scan line. So the Amiga's got a number of different um, video resolutions and color modes, and it uses bit planes. And one of them is, so normally you can only have a, a 32 colors maximum, but then there's a, a special mode called extra half bright. And what that uh, is, yeah, is EHB. Um, yeah, it's, it's briefly. Yeah, yeah so you've got your first 30, is it 32 or 16? 32, yeah, colors. Um, and then you've got a copy of them uh, that are half the brightness. Um, 
So we had it in extra half bright mode and we picked out uh, a set of base colors for the main character, Boris. Um, so you got a transparent black and then you got, I think, seven colors for Boris, I think, and then probably eight other colors that we had that were set for each background. And then on every scan line, I would change uh, 16 colors, which when it's in extra half bright, you got another 16 half half shades. So you got 32 different colors that could be changed every scan line. And that's what we did. So we'd, we'd, I'd take the 256 color PC image. I wrote my own tool for doing the processing. Um, which would turn all the RGB values into sort of um, 3D coordinates and do distances from one color to another, and then factor in the fact that um, humans, the the visual system works differently for different colors. I can't remember specifics now, but you can see more shades of, is it green or something like that? And that's just from our sort of like lizard brain being, you know, in the wild, trying not to get eaten, mm. <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> so uh, it, it was, it was, it would adjust to try and um, generate the screens as best it could, based on a little bit on how the human visual system worked and how close or far away colours were, and balance things out um, on a per scanline basis. But, you know, it wasn't perfect. And we had to have um, sprites and things in the background that would animate. Uh, and Stu would do the animations um, for those. And then there was times when we would have to make adjustments to the original graphic and maybe have to scan it in again and, and then reprocess it. So Stu had done some work on the b animated background stuff then you reprocess it and it generates some different, slightly different colours to be as optimal as it could. I mean, it, it was one of the most beautiful games on the Amiga, you know, just visually stunning. Um, but also the music was a big part of that game for me as well. I mean, before we started recording, I mentioned to you that I yeah. first got hold of a, a demo version of it on um, a magazine cover disc. And I remember just, you know, leaving the game playing in the background because that that music that you got, you know, at the start when you're mm. on that planetoid, it just sounded otherworldly you know it just it was incredible i mean was that a big part of the experience the audio on the game i think so yeah um yeah so martin was the guy who did the music uh martin's absolutely bonkers but in the nicest possible way he's he's such a brilliant guy and he did a at that time i think he was the, on, the only audio engineer there it was before uh nathan had started he was more in tomb raider times um and he had his own little room. It might have been down in the basement at this time so that he was sort of uh, insulated noise-wise or we were insulated noise-wise away from him and he'd be tinkering away and stuff. And mine was fantastic. I mean, you would just, you'd just chat to him about your ideas and the sort of stuff that you wanted. But, you know, it's often quite vague. You, you know, trying to express yourself, what you what you really wanted could be a bit vague. And he'd go off and he was a wizard. He really was. He, he, and he'd just come back with something that was just, it was way beyond what you thought you were expecting. Um, yeah, he, he, was, he was an absolutely amazing guy. And... A little bit like me, he's self-taught. You know, he has no classical training. Taught himself using trackers and, you know, he experimented with samplers and all this sort of stuff. And uh, he was experimenting with music, you know, trying to just push the Amiga various different ways. Um, I think he came from the demo scene originally and that, that was his way into making games. The, the puzzles were kind of a big part of point and click games were they tricky to kind of get the balance and the difficulty level sorted at core you lived and breathed games you know core was one of the most amazing places i've ever worked and there was such camaraderie between people people were pushing boundaries and technology but everyone was open to sharing and talking about ideas and 
you know, most of the studio would go out. Bizarrely, because people weren't originally from Derby, most people weren't. They would go out on a Thursday night to the Blessington carriage and we would just talk games and ideas and come up with ideas for the puzzles. You know, other people from other teams would chip in here and there occasionally, but it was usually the core core team there that night uh, coming up with ideas and giving things a go. Um, I think there was, there was a few where uh, they were going to be too difficult. We pushed back on them a little bit. But that that was the collaboration part of it. Everyone was sounding sounding out all these different ideas, and actually, after a few beers flowed, the ideas got a bit. <laughs> some of them got a bit silly, a little bit <laughs> out of there. Um, Experimental, yeah. And then we come in the next day and go, "What the hell were we talking about last night?" Um, Seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, we'd we'd try some of those things. We'd get them in. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think we, I don't think we had too many where we we put them in and just went these aren't working. I think we chatted a lot about what we were going to try and we rejected a small number before we even got into the game. And then it'd be a case of Stu would knock up some animations uh, and I'd start writing the code and and getting these things in. Um, and there was a few things where we needed to make adjustments, you know, the timing of things. Uh, but I, I don't think too much, really. Did you go into the arcades when you were there playing the game, Dan? Yeah, oh God, it's been many years since I played it now. I've, I, the first level sticks really strongly in my mind. Um, and then going up, you know, when you went over the um, the bridge mm. to, and you go, yeah, God, after that, it's a bit of a blur now, if I'm honest. It's a game I need to replay, actually, and I think I will after we've yeah. uh, we've had this chat. Yeah. Yeah. Levels are tough, aren't they, Amiga games? So the first level is the one that yeah. sticks in your mind because yeah. you're yeah. spent most time on that, yeah. playing it. So there was a bit in, there was an area uh, where... There was sort of a bar area, and there's a couple of arcade machines in there. I just got bored one day, so we wrote um, a Space Invaders clone. Uh, that we Why? I don't think I found no. that. <laughs> uh, you have to go back. So we, right. <laughs> we wrote a Space Invaders clone there. You just go up to the machine, and I can't remember mm. if you have to do something to get it going, or you just pr- click on it or something, use it. And we we based the images of the invaders on different people in the studio, <laughs> certain, oh, <wow. laughs> certain characteristics. So there's a, there's an animation there of a guy with big ears, and <laughs> and then there's Jez as the fat controller who's running across the top as a spaceship. Uh, and then I think we did Pac-Man as well, but we called that Beer Monster. So that was Wookie Mark who used to down. God knows how many pints of Guinness. So it's a Pac-Man clone, and you'd be running around the maze, uh, supping Guinness. <laughs> so. I can't believe I didn't. Find, I'm going to have to find that this weekend. Now <laughs> that. that sounds amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, were you a fan of um, any other point-and-click adventure games, and did any of those inspire the design of Universe? Yeah, I mean, I think we were all fans, really, uh, especially the Lucas Arts stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at those games and. They're just fabulous. I mean, the, the storytelling, the artwork, they're, they're, they're just amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I wasn't a massive player myself of uh, those sorts of games. I was more of a arcade shoot 'em up type guy. Um, but Jim played them loads. And, you know, again, we might be back at uh, his place having a few beers. We'd be playing. He'd be playing through stuff. We'd be chatting about stuff. We'd be looking over. We'd be taking ideas or ins- well, not ideas. We'd be taking inspiration from these games uh, and thinking, you know, what can we do? How how can we push things? Uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, Monkey Island, Day of the Tentacle, Sam and Max, they were all absolutely amazing. We were blown away by them. You know, we were a, a tiny, tiny team of four people. In fact, that those four people were the biggest team Core had had at the time. Uh, but I have no idea how how many people worked on the LucasArts games. But I'm sure there's a, <laughs> a lot more than four. Was there ever a plan to um, do a sequel to Universe then, or is that something you'd like to to do one day? I think there may have been initially. I. I, I think we had any outright oh we're definitely not doing this apart from the you know finishing a game by the time you finish it you hate it (laughs) you know by the time you've listened to that music however many times by the time you played that level 
a million times and you know ah oh, it's it's hard i mean i mentioned earlier when you asked me about my first game that i i did um and i said as a kid i never completed any because one of the hardest things is just finishing a game but once you get over that and you look back and you go actually yeah i'm really proud of what i did there uh so yeah we would have done something i think but things change so development timeline for universe um was about 18 months in total and again that's probably the longest dev time that core had had on any game um i was the only programmer ironically the guys doing the pc version uh there was four programmers on that um but they had to knock it out quickly and they were pretty much doing line for line uh, assembly conversion uh, to the pc um but things changed um tomb raider just started up and they they were looking for people to help out there um i was more than happy to to jump on board and help for a bit toby and toby was and paul were great friends we again we went to the pub with them on thursday nights we talked over ideas we'd seen the developments of tomb raider it was massively ambitious for the time but also had a huge potential to be amazing and toby was very very um forward looking when i joined i i, I did like a little animation sequencing editor I've done loads of editors. This is the thing on the Amiga. So knocking out some editors on the PC was just part of the course for me. Um, and what you wanted was to be able to take small animations and be able to string them together. And we had things like um, key points in the animation where the left foot planted. As it, as it hit the ground, it was the start of the event. And as it left the ground, it was the end of the event. And we had these little things in there that, allowed you to then sequence from one animation to another. Um, so that was really useful to him. And I think I started the room editor. And then we were looking at light mapping experiments. This is way before anything was doing this. And then I ended up moving on to the Saturn and porting the 3D engine. So I think if if that hadn't happened and I hadn't moved on to Tomb Raider and we'd we'd been looking around for something else to do it may well have gone ahead but mm. it was also moving over to consoles at that point in time the amiga was approaching the end of its lifestyle and the pc the pc market was a nightmare really i mean getting pc games out was painful the fragmentation on the graphics cards and sound cards you know, all the testing you had to do for all the different combinations of things that you might have plugged in. <laughs> a real pain in the arse. Um, mm. And there was a lot of piracy. I mean, there was piracy through and through everywhere. But I don't think the PC market was that great at that time. So I think it's just down to that, really. I think it's just down to the change in circumstances. And also the kind of team sizes as well, because you, you ended up working for, like, huge companies like EA and Infograms and, like, um, Infogrames. I can never say that correctly. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, what was it like working for these kind of much bigger productions? And uh, did they grow a lot compared to earlier in the decade? Yeah, yeah. I look back and my fondest memories are those small teams, you know, one coder, one artist, or universe, four people, or Tomb Raider at that time was, I think, six of us or something like that. That's where the real joy was. We, we had that for a number of years. Um, I mean, I, I, I left, I went to America, and then I came back and I went up to, um, Man well, I went to Sheffield, then Manchester. Yeah, the electronic arts stuff would have been Premier League stars, I guess that's what you're talking about. And those teams, yeah, they were much bigger at that time. I remember with doing the EA stuff and the Premier League stuff that it was very, very stressful. I think we had about 30 coders. And yeah, and it was very short timelines for that. It had to um, fit in with the, uh, the season. So we didn't have a lot of time. I mean, this is when we're at Creature Labs. Sorry. Software Creations in Manchester. And I hadn't worked on FIFA, but uh, some of the other guys on Premier League had. 
and FIFA was, we had to bang them out every year. Uh, and Premier League was effectively going to be the same thing. This was the first one, but we had to get it out in time for the season. EA, to be honest, wasn't the best experience at this time. What they were saying was that this was a new game built from ground up. Uh, wasn't true. It used the FIFA engine, um, but we had made heavy modifications, huge number of changes. But at the core, it was still the FIFA engine, uh, which was made out in Canada. And Canada basically had a hissy fit and said, if you don't give us uh, recognition on the game, we won't help you, period. And stop talking to us, <laughs> which was a nightmare. So we were trying to finish this game. EA had dragged us down to Guildford. They put us up in a hotel for the first two weeks and then they shoved us into someone's house uh, for us to sleep over there. And it was like a building site. They were having the house renovated. I don't think there was even a working shower there. And we had to live in there for three months. We had Canada unwilling to help us. We had... Um, bugs in the animation system and no one knew how the animation system worked. I spent like two weeks trying to get rid of one bug and I sort of made it go away and never appear again, but never got down to the bottom of it. And it was just a bit of a nightmare putting this together. Um, so yeah, not the best experience there, <laughs> to be honest. Well, I know you kind of um, escaped the video games industry and these days you're at Arm in Cambridge, mm. um, which we were talking about um, earlier on before we started recording. But I mean, a lot of people who worked in the industry back then these days are kind of maybe coming back into retro development and maybe, you know, making games on the old school systems again, just as either, you know, Kickstarters or like a fun project. Is there anything you'd ever think of doing then? Yeah, so... I've seen a bit of this. I mean, Colton Hanley, I used to work with him at Software Creations. He's done some C64 yeah. stuff. And Sarah Avery, she's done some C64 stuff. She was down at Core Design. And that's brilliant to see, absolutely brilliant. So there's a couple of things. One is, um, so my daughter goes to Bali and Tap on a Saturday morning. And I drive her there and I've got like an hour and a half to kill while she's doing that. So... I was playing around on a C64 emulator on my laptop while I was waiting for her, but this was before the pandemic dropped. And yeah, I was knocking together what was sort of like a Euridium style game, but I wanted to push it further. I wanted a bit of verticality in the scroller, sort of like half the screen sort of thing. And I wanted more stars in there whizzing by and... I finally started on a sprite multiplexer and got quite frustrated because I'd pretty much run out of raster time and I wanted to do so much more. Um, right. So that was that was that was an interesting journey down memory lane and I enjoyed it, but it just all got put on hold uh, due to the pandemic and stuff. Um, but what I've been doing with my son recently is teaching him how to program in Python. So there's Pygame out on Python, and he's been doing his um, D of E, uh, Duke of Edinburgh Award, as um, bronze this year. So as part of that, because of all the lockdown stuff with the pandemic, they've, they've struggled for kids to be able to do certain things, and they've allowed the parents to be more involved. Normally, I wouldn't be able to teach anyone because I'm not D of E certified, um, but they were fine with that. The school was really, really supportive. So, yeah, I went back and don't tell Archer, but I went and ripped out the sprites from Drop Zone <laughs> and uh, <laughs> got them into the into Pi game for him. And I've been working through making sort of a Drop Zone defender type game with him. Um, and he's loved it, absolutely loved it. And it's been brilliant for me. I mean, it's a great bonding experience. But also just being able to pass on some of, you know, some of what I've learnt, and then my wife has done the sound effects for it, but literally using her voice, you know, so yeah, right. <laughs> little laser, <laughs> poo 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 poo, and when the aliens die, going hey. <laughs> and all this sort of stuff. Oh, that that sounds great fun. <laughs> I'll send you a link. Uh, we put oh, you've got we it, put yeah. a little YouTube video on so that we could show his teachers. But I still love it, yeah. It's, it's that creative thing that's still inside, and I think that will always be there. Well, it's great to hear, Gary. And, you know, if you do ever pick up, like, a, 
a retro development again and you, you want us to talk about it, please do get in touch. You know, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd jump all over Yeah, that. I'll tell you what I am looking forward to is the Mega 65 when they get that released. Oh, me too. Oh, I can't wait for yeah. that. <laughs> well, Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing some of your memories. It's been fascinating to, to chat. Uh, you too, guys. Thanks so much. It's been great. <laughs>